Hi, this is Paul Case of the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series where we discuss Kempo related subjects and we usually bring on some special guests to discuss Kempo, the influences of Kempo and how it is being applied in today's modern world. We're very honored to have with us Professor Gary Lee from Texas. Gary is a very well-known martial artist from the islands of Hawaii. His heritage is in Campo, and he is also the founder and creator of the Sports Museum. So, hello, Gary, how are you? Hi, Paul, how are you? Excellent, it's good to have you on the show today. Uh, we're gonna delve into some, uh, some of the things that you like to talk about. You have a great variety of wealth of knowledge, and you're also well known in a lot of circles in tournament fighting, um, the heritage of, of the martial arts. So, Gary, why don't you give us a little bit of a background where you were born and, and your life as a young boy before you came to uh, the mainland, especially Texas? Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate having me on the show and I appreciate you taking time and allowing me to express my feelings. I grew up in Hawaii. I was born in Hilo, Hawaii, on the Big Island. And I grew up in a, in a small hut, Paul. And I was around a lot of karate enthusiasts. And to share a sensei, my sensei introduced me to Bobby Lowe, also from Kyoko Shin. But the Shiro was a kippo man under a man named William Chow. And so I learned Kushu Kippo on an early stage of what Kempo was to me. So when I came to the mainland, I had an attitude that, you know, it wasn't about, you know, coming to the mainland so much. I was ready to teach Kempo to anybody that wanted to learn it. And, you know, I had an attitude where it was stop, maim, disable, and destroy. So when I got involved with tournaments, I thought, a little bit different. I wasn't the best fighter. I was just scrappy, I don't say bad. But why, you know, Toshiro Sensei thought that I was different. So he sent me on a one-way ticket and I was adopted by uh, Sifu Lee in San Francisco. And, you know, when I came to the mainland, I was young and I was ignorant, but I've learned a lot from a lot of good people. And I grew up on come, a lot. Let me interrupt you for a second. When did you come to the mainland? How many years were you on uh, in Hawaii before you finally moved over to the mainland? My parents were killed in a bike plane crash, but I came to the mainland at 14, and it was 1969. And, you know, it was the early years of, of sport karate, and I was lucky enough to be around some incredible people. So... That's that was the beginning of my journey in America or the mainland. The specific style of the martial arts of the, the form that you were taught in Hawaii was a form of kempo, correct? Kempo and Toshiro, a sensei, taught me. Uh, well, you know, kempo. The way I was taught was all the fundamentals. You know, point A to point B. But we I, we were instilled the instinct of surviving through the crane the tiger, the monkey, the snake, and the imaginary animal, which a mainland didn't really understand, the dragon. And the dragon was a fanatic. And, and to be able to hit people in a part of their body that they never felt pain before, plus they'll always remember that. So that was uh, the attitude I had in Kippo, the learning to pass on knowledge, but also to be humble in how you teach but also teach real, authentic martial arts. When you were there in Hawaii, did you spend any time uh, directly with Professor Chow? No, sir, I did not. But uh, I was around a, a lot of different people who now I, I, I remember vividly that I'm older, but also you know understand there were different styles of martial arts. And there was from Ishimaru to Okinawa Karate Shonru. There were a lot of a lot of different people from different styles. I see. When you were there, did you spend any time with people like Mr. Imperato or Tina Tulasega or any of those individuals? Well, no, not Mr. Imperato, but I tell you about Tino. He he I met him in the early years. And you know, the neat thing I, I understand about him was Lima Lama was well, it, I tell you another man that we've lost, 
Canterbury. He was very close to me. And, uh, you know, Lima Lama and the other styles of Hawaiian martial arts were different. And it's not that we were better or anything, but it's like Mr. Parker. When he came to America, sir, he brought the Kempo and he changed it to what he wanted to do. And it changed the world. So Kempo is is really unique in all the ways of being able to teach it. But Tino, I got to meet him in the early 70s. And I realized that, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. John Natividad and Mr. Norris told me one time that they would work out, but they would always go to Tino's to fight because it was a fighting school. So that was really cool, I thought. So, okay, so now you've got your base training in Hawaii. You go to, to you move to uh, San Francisco in 1969 and 14. What was the climate like in San Francisco regarding the martial arts? Well, I was thrown into a Kung Fu studio and I'll be honest with you, Paul, I didn't like it, you know, cause I, 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 I didn't adjust to the Kung Fu attitude, but I think it was really a funny story. Six months, finally, I'm just, I'm just aggravating Sifu Lee. That was my Sifu. And I said, please let me fight. Please let me fight. He would always, I would do form self-defense. But finally, one Thursday night, he says, okay, Gary, you can spar tonight. So I was excited. This is before equipment. I was wrapping my hands up and everything. And he goes, Susan, Susan. And I said, Sifu, please, please don't make me fight a woman for my first fight. And he said, no, if you fight in this quoon, you know, under me, you'll fight Susan first. Well, after I got knocked out, I'll be honest with you, after I woke up, I'll put it that way, I had instant respect for women, Kung Fu, and the unknown. And I was very lucky to uh, be around Kung Fu the way I was in the early days of San Francisco. And I got to meet a lot of really incredible people. So... You know, it was an interesting journey, Paul. Did you ever have the chance in, in San Francisco in 69? Did you get the chance to see me meet maybe Ralph Castro or or any of the other uh, leaders in the in the Bay Area? Well, I was under Sipu's rest in peace, Sid Campbell. And Sid introduced, Uncle Sid, that's why I called him, introduced me to some incredible people. And, you know, Paul, you know, I'm not a name dropper, but if you mention them, I'll tell you a story about them if you if you know some people. Like you mentioned the other day, Uncle Wally J. You uh -huh. know, he was influential in my life and he helped me in my journey in Texas. And uh, you know, I was around a lot of I was just lucky, Paul, you know, blessed. Did you but, ever uh, get a chance of spending quality time with maybe Danny Asano, uh Taki Kabora, and things like that? And people like well, that? I actually one of the first performers at the Knott's Place Farm under female DeMuro. That's mm -hmm. how I got hooked on Astro World. You know, I worked for Six Flags for almost 35 years, and mm -hmm. I was the first person to introduce karate into the Six Flags amusement system. But female Sensei DeMuro, DeMuro Sensei, was the one that introduced me to entertainment, and I was very lucky. Okay, so we're now, you're sitting there training in San Francisco, you say you're in. Uh, they're being introduced to kung fu, but you didn't appeal to you. Where did you go from there? Well, I was lucky enough to be able to go across country three or four times by hitchhiking. I'm almost embarrassed to say that because, you know, I didn't have money. I I didn't have a car, and I got lucky to go and we could hitchhike across America at that time. And I had a surfboard, so that was interesting. A little five-seven surfboard and all my weapons. And you can imagine a guy on the side of the road with nunchucks, a bow, size, and a backpack and a surfboard. So I got picked up by different people, but I was very lucky. I got to go cross country three different times. And I trained all across the country with many, many, many people. And it was a, a journey that I wanted to do because I tell you, Paul, I should sit on the ocean's edge in Hawaii and I could see the mainland and all the pictures that I've seen in, you know, the magazine stuff. And so I'm overwhelmed now that I'm in the mainland all these years and running into the sport karate museum. And, you know, I concentrate only on the sport 
karate heroes, you know, the ones that help create sport karate in America. And that's why I enjoy talking to you so much. You come from Frank Trail, and Frank was my friend. And Kempo, the guys that, that I'm impressed with, that I love talking to you, like Bob White, John Cipolla, Neil Harden. I mean, John Conway, God bless John Conway. You know, the history they have. You know, Kempo guys have really adopted me, and I appreciate the guys like that that have done that. So, yes, you know, I love Kempo. You're, you're learning different styles. You're traveling around the country. When did you finally end up in, um, in uh, Texas? Or, is that, or did you say somewhere before that? I was lucky enough that, well, I, to make, I'll make a, here, I ended up living in the basement of Sam Chapman's karate school in Greenville, South Carolina for the three years when the beginning after, two years I stayed in the Quoon. But the neat thing about it is when I was adopted by Sam Chapman, I got to meet people like Joe Corley, who changed my life, who is still changing my life. But, you know, I got to fight amazing people. And, you know, I, I watched Keith Vitale grow into a three-time national champion. And I remember when Keith and all the guys, they were dreaming, like myself, that sport karate would change the world and it has and that's what we do at the museum at the sport karate museum we honor the sport karate we'll get more into the sports uh, museum later in the discussion i really want to focus only on your roots so we can get some foundation there so you're you're watching uh competition in the late 60s now early 70s and you're competing as well what was the biggest impact that you found in these tournaments that you would attend in that period of your life? Well, okay. In, after I left Sam's school, I started running the first discotheque in Greenville, South Carolina called the Electric Warehouse. But I was hungry to fight, to do karate. So I ended up going to Texas in 1979, in the early years. And I was adopted by J. Pat Burleson, George Minshew, and the Texas guys. Alan Steen, and I'll be honest, and again, like Kung Fu, I didn't really enjoy Taekwondo, and I was kind of in a position where I had to teach Taekwondo, but I was always a Kempo guy, so I introduced Bull in the Ring, which is really a Kempo subject. Texas changed me, because I fought everywhere, and I was very lucky. I, I, you know, I got a few awards, and I was always in the top 10 and fighting kata and weapons in Texas in the AOK. And then, of course, when the NBL years came and the nasty years and the other groups, I got involved with them. Who were the, uh, the prominent fighters during that era from, say, 69 to maybe middle of the 70s that really influenced you? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, my hero is Mike Stone and John Natividad. And, but... I Why is that? Why is that, Gary? What do those well, two men instill in you or inspire you or impress you with? Well, Mr. Stone and Mr. Nivet and Mr. Parker were from Hawaii. And, you know, te John Nivet is Tang Sudo and, and Mr. Stone is Sean Ru, and, of course, Mr. Parker is Kimpo, but they're from Hawaii. And to me, I realized that I was the lucky one because there was hundreds of Hawaiians that were 10 times better than I was, and they didn't get the opportunity I did. So, you know, those guys were my first heroes, but there was incredible fighters. And, you know, I, I was around a lot of people, Paul, so it's hard for me to mention everybody. Well, let's just talk about Mr. Stone. Obviously, he had already, you know, had won the internationals twice, first, first grand champion 64 and then repeat champion 65. Then he went on to do other competitions and fighting. And then he obviously had his tournaments that he created, the Four Seasons, and created his fighters. What kind of relationship did you have with Mr. Stone? Well, he came all the way from the Philippines. We had the grand opening to cut the black ribbon on the museum. And he was the first person that I called when, when I was, well, around all the incredible people I was around to create the Sport Karate Museum. 
So I called him very, very much, a lot, all the, through the years. And finally, when I had the position to create the museum and create a grand opening and invite everybody, God bless Mr. Stone. He came all the way from the Philippines to cut the ribbon. So yes, I have a deep relationship with Mike Stone. Mr. Natividad, tell us about him. Okay, well, we, I got the honor of roasting him in Las Vegas two years ago. And, you know, John, to me, has always been the person that was the guy that was the influence of kicking. And I'll tell you a funny story. God bless Monster Man every day. He used to call me monthly. And we'd always talk about John because John had two things that was very autonomous. He always was going to win most of his events by, you know, his incredible way of fighting. And he always had four girls on his shoulder. And Monster Man would always love to tell that story. But John Natividad was one of the greatest fighters. His nickname was the Giant Killer. Needless, nothing else to say. <laughs> no. Okay, let's move on uh, from that era. We get now into the mid to late 70s, early 80s. What fighters stood out in your opinion? Well, I was wanting to move to Texas. So, of course, I went after people like Mr. Steen and Jim Buton and Chuck Lovin, rest in peace, and, of course, Mr. Burleson and George Minshew. And Mr. You know, Mr. Chapman was amazing. He, he knew a lot of these people, and he guided me to the right people in Texas. And I was just adopted. You know, I was very lucky. I'm very proud of the fact that Mr. Jim Harrison, rest in peace, called me up one day and he says, Gary, there's only four adopted Texans. Do you understand? There's Chuck Norris, there's Jack Wong. Okay. I mean, come on, man. Think about it. There's me and then there's you. So understand that what you've done for Texas is been pretty good. So accept it. You're an adopted Texan. So after that, Paul, I, I just really focused on a lot of the Texas guys and, and, and did what I did. Yes, sir. I, you're looking at, um, you're look, we're talking about Jim Harrison. Tell oh. us about Jim Harrison. Well, Mr. Harrison came in my life in the early seventies and he actually became the godfather to my son. And, you know, I, I never really actually trained with him. I always thought that I had to put him around good people. So my job was to put him around people like Mr. Burleson and Mr. Steen at my events. And that's what I did up until his passing. Now, Mr. Harrison would call me regularly and he would put me in my place and help me make decisions toward the Sport Rider Museum, which was authentic and real. So that's what's really powerful about my relationship with Mr. Harrison. He really cared about my future with Texas. He was the originality of the what they call the blood and guts era. Mm -hmm. And uh, he introduced, well, back then, bear fighting, bear fist fighting, as you know, was brutal. And mm -hmm. there was something that played differently than people like Mr. Harrison and Mike Stone. They took it as a serious part of sharing their martial arts to the public in the way that they were taught. And they were taught reality. So... Let's go to uh, your competition, your competitiveness. What areas did you compete in at tournaments? Well, in 1979, they invented what they called the AOK in Texas, the Amateur Organization of Karate. It was put together by Roy Kerbin, George Minshew, Ishmael Robles, Al Francis, Mickey Fisher, Jose Santa Maria, and Joe Alvarado. And it was because the boxing commission thought the, the fighting in Texas and karate was too hard, too brutal. So they were going to come in and take over. So they formed this amateur organization of karate. I jumped right in and I got involved with AOK up into my NBL NASCAR years. But I did win the MVP of the AOK, the Golden Greek Award, named after Demetrius Sabanis. It took me 17 years. I got to tell you a funny story. 
So when the Golden Greek passed away in that plane crash, they decided to give the Golden Greek Advantage Award to the best fighter, the best kata guy. And I really wanted that bad. So for, for the first seven years, that's a long time, I pursued it. And I lost it sometimes by two or three points. So I got frustrated and started going to the NBL and NASCAR tournaments and the USAF tournaments. But then in 1997, this is almost since, well, 70, 81. So that's like what, 16 years, 20 years? 81? Excuse me, that's uh, that's 40 years ago. Well, now I'm talking about 81 to 1997. Oh, well, that would be 17 years, yeah. Okay, 17 years 16, later. 16, 17 my, years, yeah. My student named Wade Kirkpatrick, who worked for Chuck, Mr. Norris, decided to say, listen, I'm going to go after the Golden Greek. Why don't you join me? Well, I was active at NBL and NASCAR and other tournaments. And I said, no, I tried it in the first seven years. And he taught me into it. So we went to over 40 tournaments in one year. And I won the Golden Greek in 97 with my student, Wade Kirkpatrick. So that's the most important award I feel that I've won through the years. But the NBL, I've been very lucky to be you know, in their Hall of Fame. And I won a gold medal in 1993 at the USAF. And that's a funny story, I got to tell you that. So there was like 83 competitors. Have you ever competed in a tournament where there's 83 people in your division? Only internationals. <laughs> See? See? It was 83 and I had a third round seed. So all those people competed first. And then, you know, it was like a two hour thing. And the judges were Mikami Sensei from New Orleans, Thomas the Puppet, Alice Plus One Steinberg, Roger Green. You know, it was a, it was hard, but I had, you know, and everybody was doing bow. Everybody. I had learned Toshido, Toshiro, uh, <laughs> I, it's hard for me to say it, uh, Tomini no Ku from Sid Campbell. And I called him up and I said, Uncle Sid, everybody's doing a bow. What do I do? He says, do you remember the Sienshin Sai Kata I taught you? And I said, yes, sir. He says, make it with Tony Melku. I said, Uncle Sid, there's incredible judges out there. I don't want to mix two different katas. And he said, are you arguing with me? I said, no, sir. So I went out there and did Tomi Melku with Sienshin Sai Kata, and I won the gold medal. So it was very, very interesting. How many, uh, let's ask you in your competition, how many roughly tournaments did you compete in during those during that period? Well, I, I don't know. I tell you what, it's really funny. I had a phone call from uh, Mr. Parker, you know, Ed, you know, I call him Mr. Parker, but he, he said, Gary, my dad is Mr. Parker. You know him for a long time, call me Ed. And I said, yes, sir. So he called me up and we started talking about my diary because I kept a diary of everything I'd done. And uh, I did a lot of competition, Paul. But I'll just give you this. From 1981 to 1998, I was disqualified 237 times. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that my Kempa was different or the way I fought was different. Back then, they didn't like stomping and kicking the, or hitting the groin a lot or ripping the groin or symbolizing that. But, you know, a lot of guys back then didn't realize that there were some fighters that didn't just fight for a trophy or a rating or, or recognition. To me, it was representing my art. And now I think that's the reason why I've got such a good support in the museum because people know there's that word again authenticity and i believe in that that's what kippo taught me authenticity i think the key word would be by if it to be to be honest with you gary is that be efficient be effective be authentic be great well i, I believe in all those words except for great because there's so many so many people paul that are like i said earlier there were hundreds of Hawaiians that could have done what John and not what Mike Stone did because Mike Stone was different, but what John and I and Ken Rubago and other people from Hawaii have done in America. So I'm very humbled that 
that God gave me the position to come to the mainland. I really mean that. You know, I really do. I get emotional sometimes thinking about how I was chosen to come to the mainland. That's how I feel about every time I do a tournament. Well, that's your Hawaiian heritage. That's your Hawaiian legacy. That's what is special about you, your sp your Hawaiian spirit. By the way, when I use the word great, meaning you will be great. When, when you're good, you'll tell everybody. And we know that. When you're great, they'll tell you because you're a leader. You're a leading by example. You're trying to be the best you possibly can. And there is still always room for that. So I wanted to qualify that. Um, you know, you're, so you're getting now in, in your competition, who are you training with at this point, uh, in, throughout the seventies, uh, uh, in your, well, your martial arts, with, but in Texas. Okay. I want to cut, cause that was where basically my career kind of skyrocketed. You know, George Minchu was my coach, but I was a Sherman Oak Raider for 12 years under Pops Cransnew and the Sherman Oak Raiders were people like. Alvin Prouder, Leo Career, Ray Wizard, Drew, and Barry, and of course my best buddy, Butch Togasala, and we traveled a lot together. And uh, you know, training with all the different people, I guess I became a mutt, as they say. You know, training with different styles and different attitudes. I'll tell you a good story, Paul. When I would go to dojos, and they weren't real friendly back then. I would go to a corner and I'd find a broom and I would start sweeping. And then eventually when no one would come up and say us or hello or whatever, I'd go into a bathroom, change in my gi, go to that same corner I swept out and start doing kata. And kata, real kata is mesmerizing. And people would come up and and under, well, want to say, well, what is that or how? How are you presenting your karate? Because a lot of I said, a lot of guys didn't understand, you know, the katas I was doing. I was doing jihan and kokudai and wasu and all the styles. The katas now are very basic. They do because they've been introduced. But back in the early 70s, people weren't used to seeing those unless they were around with people like Tadashi and Mirazaki and these guys that they followed. Did you compete a lot in, in weapons division? Oh, I, I won weapons many times in Texas. But, you know, I was known as a sword man because, you know, I worked for Six Flags for 35 years. And I learned my sword from Sid Campbell and other people like that. And my, my main sword instructor for 25 years was Michael Nershade, the, the famous Hollywood actor. And But, you know, he's gone. But he taught me. Imor Shirayado, the art of the five draw, which is only five cuts. So it's boring to the majority of people. So honestly, Paul, I kind of went to the dark side because I started becoming an entertainer. And I started drawing and doing entertainment draws. But Makeup Mako would always put me in my place and I would do what he taught me. And people would accept that eventually because they understand what authenticity is. Did you find yourself gravitating to creating your own school to teach? Or Never. did you just more so like, uh, uh, basically a roving martial arts? My connection is to, to Shiro and Kempo and to Bobby Lowe and Kyogi Shin. I mean, I could never do that. I mean, honestly, in my heart, I'm okay, when I left Hawaii, Paul, I thought I'd, a 50 robot about lived underneath a waterfall in Okinawa, Japan. I never dreamed that I'd see the martial arts I saw in America or the mainland. And uh, I never would dream that I would do anything on my own. I, I was dedicated to the Kempo that I came to America with and still am. Are there people that stand out in your mind that were the great influences on your life that you still talk to today? Well, sadly, many people like Ted DeBurr and Jim Harrison and Sid Campbell and Michael are gone. But Mr. Minshew and Mr. Norris and Mike Stone are, are and John Natividad and John Conway from Kempo. What an inspiration it is to talk to him and the memory. But yes, those guys, there's, I, I mean, Mr. Joe Corley, 
who's been my mentor and helped me with the Sport Crowd Museum all these years. Uh, he's a mentor. But, you know, I'm very lucky to be around or been around some of those people. And now that I've got the Sport Crowd Museum, I get a lot of phone calls, a lot of people that care and understand what I've done. I've done it for 30 years, Paul. That's a long time. <laughs> yes, it is. Hi, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, do you do you speak, uh, do you spend kind of quality time with um, some of the competitors that you competed with? Have you ever reached out to them? Do you talk with some of the guys you said, gee whiz, we went to get, we went at each other, but we're now friends? Everybody, except for a couple, I still have a deep relationship with. And, you know, sometimes in a day, Paul, uh, again, I'll share with you, I get 10, 15, 20 phone calls a day. A lot of it's, I guess, because of the radio show I do now, but, you know, in the museum. But a lot of people check on me and call me and, and talk to me. Well, yeah, I talk to a lot of guys I bang with. I'll give you a funny story. Um, Bruce Brucci from Columbia, South Carolina, one of the best heavyweights ever. I communicate with him a lot, and I had wars with him. And But, you know, a lot of people that are involved with the sport karate from the 70s and 80s, you know, you got to reach out to them and talk to them. So that's why the radio show, and that's why this is important, because people understand people like you, what you do with the Hall of Fame, and what I've done with the sport karate museum, gives a platform for people to share with them the history of what we accumulated in America. I believe in that. I really agree. I, here's a, a thought for you. Um, in your relationship with Frank Trejo, you brought him up earlier. Uh, obviously, we've discussed this before. I tested with him uh, for Black. March 21st, 1981, there were 17 us testing. Three or four were going for Brown. Uh, but the remainder were all going for black, and we had 12 of the most prominent uh, seniors that were on that board. I mean, the who's who were there. And uh, proud to say Frank called me his Campo's son. What was your relationship with uh, Frank Trejo? Okay, it goes back to 1983 or 82, and I was working out with Colonel Jack Farr, and he was under Mr. Parker, and Ms. and. Jack wanted me to test with 30 degree black belt under Mr. Parker and his group. And I didn't want to go up in rank because it wasn't important to me. I was in down for 10 years from Hawaii. So Jack got upset. He said, listen, be at the school, answer the phone, no matter, and don't leave. So I, I did. And I waited. And I got really kind of upset because it was like an hour late. But who was it? It was Mr. Parker. And he says, Gary. Rank is not important to you now, but it will be someday in your journey. So this third degree black belt underneath the Chinese Karate Federation and me is important. And Jack Farr cares about you, so test. So I tested at the Lama Nationals in Chicago under John Townsley, Rick Fowler. I know you know Rick Fowler, Dan Anderson, uh, uh, golly bum, uh, Ken Knudsen, and Jack, and never test on a never test for a black belt 30 degree black belt and fight in a national tournament on the same day you don't do that but i did and i made 30 degree black belt and then what happened was i went to a tournament and there was frank frank and i went to a tournament and there was tom kelly and frank and i stomped the guy and uh frank and tom came with me and mr kelly said good stop i'll never forget it and I became friends with Frank and Tom then. And then the best story is it's 19, I think 93. And I'm in the hotel at the Black Belt Magazine Hall Festival that they had, the only one they had. And I'm sitting with Jeff Smith and he just gave me his uniform top, signed it for the museum, his red, white, and blue top. And Frank comes walking in and I see him, I jump up. And I don't tell Jeff or anything, but I run and Frank runs and we bang each other like two bulls. <laughs> and we hug each other and I take him over to Mr. S or Jeff and we talk for into the evening. And I, 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 you know, I miss guys like Frank. They're good people, you know, good heart. And then, you know, you, you being underneath him, to me, when I talk to you, it reminds me of 
of Frank. So, you know, I, I don't want to get emotional. I just want you to know that you remind me of, every time I've talked to you on the phone, it reminds me of people like Bob White and Frank and the couple guys that were really instrumental in changing American sport karate. I believe that. You know, Kimbo was instrumental in helping America understand what real fighting is. Because maybe you don't have a big name like Bob White or whoever. Those Kimbo guys fought hard. I mean, there was a guy in Ohio I met that was under a guy named AVA. His name was Danny Grogan. He was one of the most dangerous men I ever met. And he was Kimbo. But he never bragged and never told anybody. But people didn't want to lie up next to him. They didn't, because he was Kempo. And he had Kempo on the back of his gi, so everybody knew it. And But they watched him, and they didn't want to fight him. They just, he was just a dangerous point fighter. And I love that terminology. That's pure Kempo. If you become a dangerous black belt point fighter, that's Kempo. Thus. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate the, you know, the compliments. Frank was Frank Trejo. There will only be one Frank Trejo. Amen. But his inspiration and his influence has yeah. transcended a lot of people. He had a reverse punch from hell. He had a great reverse punch. Sure. He was one of the best. You know. yeah, he, uh, there's yeah. many of, I just recently posted up a clip of him from uh, the internationals team fighting where he's fighting Pinnell. And uh, uh, we, we emphasized a few of the strikes there. And trust me, it's, it's rather impressive. An amazing counter puncher. He taught me a lot about footwork and he, what he was doing was that he was taking what Mr. Parker had created American Kempo. Parker took from the islands of Hawaii and his influences from Chow and his judo and jiu-jitsu and, and, and Western boxing and then the Chinese influence. And Frank took that and then he incorporated it with fusion boxing. And so when he taught me uh, big on footwork, big on balance, combinations, and uh, as you know, many times when you watch fighters today, either in tournaments or in a, in a school, they have a tendency to engage, but they're usually very linear with their movement straight ahead instead of reading the, the opponent and then angling off to counter them so that they can have the response. And the, you do that, you can read the body language of your opponent and, and the natural response will be, a weapon that will just fit perfectly there rather than forcing um, some kind of response that you might have practiced. It, it, did, it really doesn't work as well. I had a great conversation with uh, C. Joe Steve Muhammad and one of the greatest tournament fighters that ever existed. And he told me about training with Bruce Lee for the last five years of his life. And they became good friends. And it wasn't just one time, numerous times, over those five years and the lessons he shared oh, in that interview were amazing. Oh, let me tell you about my encounter with Bruce Lee. Okay, I just got to America, it's 1969 and I'm in California and I find out that Joe Lewis in Sherman Oaks is doing a seminar. So I go there, it's packed and I'm just, I'm just a kid, but I, I run by and bump into this Chinese guy who I didn't know and I realized Everybody's going nuts. And I walk in and I talk to somebody. I forget the name. I said, man, why is everybody raising so much hell? It's just Joe Lewis. And they said, no, that's Bruce Lee. And that was what I bumped into him. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's my only encounter with Mr. Lee. But, you know, I went to all his movies and I was a big fan. You know, sure. but that was, that was funny. How was, I mean, I bumped into it, man. I mean, that was cool. We've had but, some interesting discussions here on the Kempo uh, educational video series. And uh, one of them was American Kempo and Jeet Kune Do. The talking similarities, contrast, comparison, things like that. And the way, the mindset. And when you look at it, Mike Stone brought it up in his discussions with, with Bruce all the years he was with him and Parker. And, and there's more similarities than there are differences. However, I find that Parker came uh, and brought together the, what he thought was the complete system to fighting. And it could be adapted in many ways. Um, Bruce uh, was one that said he wanted to focus more on combat fighting. However, he was a martial arts actor. So he I would agree. utilize things for the movies. I, 
adapt. I love that word adaptability because I believe Mr. Parker, he was brutal, but he knew he had to conform to the American way. And so again, there goes Kimpo. Kimpo adapts to the environment that it's around. Doesn't matter if it's big, little, small, fat, skinny, fast, or slow. We adapt. And the adaptation, that, okay, it's help me say that word. Adapt, say it for me. Adapt. The adaption, I'll say that. The adaption of what you do around your environment is important. And that's pure Kempo. Well, that was what Parker was about. He, he, he took all these. And what he was doing was that his influences were mixed martial arts. Truly was. And he brought it to America. And he fashioned it in a way that people could relate to it. Look at bouldering. The application of you put 20 people around you. You give them a number. You call out the number. It starts out with one, two, three. Then he goes five, six, 17, 19, one, eight. And you get all these people coming at you. That's pure Kempo. Sure. And, you know, Texas wasn't ready for that. But back in the early 70s when I gave it to a lot of people, now they do it in every school, but they do it with equipment on. They don't do the self-defense like we did in the early days. But so let's cool. go on. Let's let's move on, Gary. Let's get into some things that you're really currently doing now. So you developed, you're the creator, founder of the sport, karate, the sports museum karate sports museum correct yes sir well what happened was in 1998 i was going to build an amusement park area out of houston i was working with investors and one of the investors passed away and then the other gentleman went to disneyland so i was stuck with the idea of the museum so i created the roast where i roasted a celebrity or someone who was an icon in america and then I was building the idea of a museum, which took a, year, a couple of years to do it. And I got involved with some people that, that helped me. And I created the idea, which you have to be first with the vision, that I wanted to honor everybody that was part of the sport karate history and bringing it to America. And now after 30 years, it's doing that. And, uh, but it started in 1998 with the Rose and the vision of building park, an amusement park area, and then it turned out to an actual museum. And every year, I've collected memorabilia from Golly Bum, Paul. I've got Joe Lewis's black belt, Junior Reed's black belt, Mike Stone's black belt, uh, a Golly Bum, uh, Ed Daniels black belt. I've got, I got over two hundred uniforms that are signed. I've got, the, I've even got the bullet that Chuck shot. J. Pat Burleson with on the Texas Walker Ranger program. I mean, I've got some, some incredible stuff that people don't realize. But here's the point. They trust me. It would mean they believe that. I, believe, I know they could have given it to their sons or their daughters or their family, but when they, when they gave it to me, they trusted me with their memory. And that's what I do with the museum. I, I build that authenticity up, and it's worked out really well. Let's talk about the sports museum, okay? So obviously it was a it was a concept that came up. Uh, when what year was the first first year of the museum? Well, I got a conference call from people like Peter Urban and Sid Campbell, and this was back in the day when people didn't have come, and all these guys called me up at, on this conference call, and they said, "Look, Gary, Ken Knudsen was the leader. No, Sid was." And he said, "Look, Gary, Alan." He said, we, have, we, we understand what you're doing and we want to be behind you. So we're going to create the history generals for you. And these are the guys that you can trust and have be your mentors. And I, I didn't, I was fine. It went in one ear out the other, but now I understand. Now I understand that the history generals are important because they're the ones that helped me and helped create sport karate in America. So that's what I've done. I put these guys together and all the things that I've done. Uh, the museum is really about the life that Sport Karate brought to America. Because remember this, Paul, and I know you know this, we're all Asian influence, but Sport Karate was born in America by some incredible people. And uh, these people like Mike Stone, I'm gonna use him because he, he is such a mentor to me. He came to America. He was the first superstar of sport karate. 
And not only what he did as fighting, but like you said, he created the Four Seasons. He created the Golden Fist Awards. He was a movie star. He was a writer. He showed America that people, that martial arts, and you know, people like Mr. Norris helped too, of course, but Mike Stone told the American public that martial arts was something of the future and look what it's become. So, yes. So going I'm, back to I'm, my question though, what was the first year of the sports museum? Oh, 1999. Okay, and 1999. It grew, it evolved for the support and participation of many of the people that you've discussed today, brought their names up. When did you evolve? Uh, how many pieces do you have there collected? I mean, there must be a substantial amount of uh, memorabilia. I have a, a thing on Facebook. It's called the Artifacts of the Sport Carter Museum. And it's listed all the artifacts. But I get stuff periodically from all over the country. But uh, I've got an incredible amount of stuff that people don't understand because they're personal. And this is what I, I promised all those history generals in the beginning that three things they made me promise one i can never solicit which i don't two i had to get something autographed from them that was personal and that's why i've got so many personal stuff and three <laughs> i had to know 30 years of their history or more for them to be invited so you know there's a lot of people that have come up to me and said well i want to be a History general. Well, God bless you. You know, there's an ambassador or something, but you can't be a history general like you or Frank or Mr. Parker, whoever, you know, unless unless you have those three qualifications. And I've been lucky enough to get some incredible things from how many people. different awards do you you present every year? Well, I, I have the probably bum have all the uh well I tell you let's talk about the Kimpo. I called up Liana back after Mr. Parker passed away and talked to it, little, Ed, little Ed, you know, and Liana. And I said, I'd like to give out a Mahalo uh, award at, at Mr. Parker's name and memorial name. And she gave me permission. Go, Alan Gober got the first one. I believe you got one too. Yes, and, sir, I did. Uh, I'm very yes, honored. Then I give out fighting awards. I give out two awards in fighting one from Lightweight, the Jim Harrison Memorial Fighting Award, and Mr. Lewis. I got to tell you the story about that. Mr. Lewis is in the hospital, and Mr. Smith and Mr. Wallace was there. And, they, you know, Mr. Wallace always ragged Mr. Lewis. They were just at each other. And Mr. Lewis called me up and said, Gary, blank, 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 I know you're going to give a blank, blank, blank award in my name when I die, aren't you? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, with your permission, he said, you better make sure that blankly blank can blankly blank fight or I will come down and sidekick you. He said, no, sir, you'll jap slap me. And you hear Bill Wallace in the background laughing. And uh, he, he said, you have my permission. So every year, I through Mr. Crum, he would, he, he said, he'd come down and jap slap me unless that person could fight. And I said, well, I'll make sure. So the first year, I asked him, I said, who did I give it out the first year? And he goes, I haven't died yet. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, listen, who do you want me to do? And he said, Chuck, uh, uh, Mr. Smith, Mr. Corley, Mr. Wallace, who else? There was one other person. Anyway, every year I give out the Mr. Lewis and Morrow and Mr. Harrison. Just recently, he, I lost him. But we give out fighting words in their name. And then I honor the military, too which is a big deal. I've got people like Danny Lane and Danny McCall and Colonel Phil Torres and lots of people who support and are on the board for me to recognize people who are of, of military service. And we give out that military award. Then we also give a, a, a first responders award to all the policemen, God bless them, and the firefighters and everybody that's on the first line. So we give out quite a few recognition awards to people from the museum, but they have to be recommended by one of the history general to be able to go after and do that. So it's not like me, I don't do it. I always go to mentors and ask them and recommend people. 
like you. I went to John Paul <laughs> Casey, and I found out that you're the known as the real deal, but you care, and that's important because I know a lot of people talk, but you care, Paul. I know you do, and that's important. I feel, and that's why I'm here. Thank you, Gary. Let's go to one of your other projects where your voice is heard uh, weekly. Uh, your radio program. Tell us about that. How to come about. Who listens to you and who are some of the subjects or what are some of the subjects and who are the special guests? Well, I've been very lucky. My very first guest was a Kempo animal, Bob White. He was almost seven years ago. And I don't know why I'm still on the air, but, you know, I've been very lucky. And, and it's produced out of North Carolina and it's on every Tuesday night. And my co-host, A.J. Perry, and the Wolverine Dean Piles helped me interview some of the incredible people involved with the martial arts. Not just black belts, not just producers, but people who are part of the martial art community around America. But Bob White started me off. And uh, from that time on, seven years, every Tuesday night at 9.30 Eastern Standard Time, I'm in people's homes. And I've got over, golly bum, I think, 10,000 listeners now, and it's growing. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And it's a great service because people are hearing your, your radio program and being educated. I think the key for me uh, and the purpose of the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series is, one, to bring a community together because we have a sense of lack of leadership perceived leadership the true leaders will lead but there's that perception so the hall of fame was created when i talked to frank about this and frank handpicked the first 10 i picked two of those outside of that so that was 12 number 11 and 12 were ed parker and frank trejo subsequently every year that group chooses within themselves to recognize people for their contributions their accomplishments, their leadership skills through either competition, instructional, or some people are just, as you call them, ambassadors for the martial arts. They go out there and they believe in it. Maybe they weren't great competitors. Maybe they're, they are not instructors, but their recognition and their belief and passion for it influences many others. And some of our ambassadors usually come from mostly from the educate uh entertainment world people like elvis presley dick dale etc 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 sort of the catch-all of of the of the categories but um the key was to bring together a community that was sort of not unified and we were more at each other's uh throats than we were patting each other's backs and so the idea was to do that. And then subsequently, uh, the educational video series is to bring the intellectual side of the martial arts up. Most people know when they go into a school, they say, teach me how to not block with my face, how to make a difference. So instructor teaches them how to do it. The educational video part addresses the part of Mr. Parker's thinking man's martial arts. So we educate and we teach you why you do it. So now you have how and you have why. She whiz sort of reminds you of something, right? Right fist, left hand coming together. However, the one piece of the glue that's missing to bring these two factions together is the spiritual side. That is driven. You have that naturally from your Hawaiian heritage. Anybody that trains in the martial arts will be in tune with it. There's a very famous quote by Albert Einstein. He says, energy is never destroyed. It just takes on a new shape, evolves. And that's what the martial arts does, bringing us together as one so we have a goal to unify ourselves. We train so we won't have to fight. If we want to compete, we do it civilly. And then when we're done, we respect one another. So that is my goal for the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame, to bring people together, to educate them, and hopefully the goal is to unify them in a spiritual way, a spiritual path, so they can share this 
with fellow I martial got, artists. I got the call from Dennis Kanasker, and it was very emotional because I spent hours, you know, I mean, I spent, I spent a lot of time with Dennis talking to him, but he shared with me that he had nominated me for the Kip Hall of Fame. It was very emotional because, you know, I belong to the Masters Hall of Fame and other things, and that's cool. God bless him. But I always wanted to be a part of Mr. Parker and all these incredible people like you to to honor Kempo. And Kempo, you know, the thing about like Dennis, you know, and Con Mr. Conway, they live their lives for Kempo too. And they are educators. And that's what's really cool about what you're doing. You're educating. And people who educate, like I do my radio show and like yourself and with the Hall of Fame, people from this generation or from the next generation, they'll understand that we had an establishment that wasn't so much better than Taekwondo or Ishinru or Shotokan. It was just different, but it was different in a way that people respected the knowledge that they learned that they could add it to the fundamentals that they already knew. So ask most people that you talk to if they're Shotokan, Ishinru or whatever, They've had Kempo in their lives some way or another. They've been touched by someone from the history that Mr. Parker created. So American Kempo is powerful and it's around the world, but you gotta remember the roots like in Hawaii, you know, I was very lucky, like I said, with one of the guys, but you know, Mr. Parker changed the attitude of karate, I think in the world because American Kempo is different. Again, it's not better, but it's different. And it's been accepted, you know, and the Kempo Hall of Fame is the establishment that sets the standard for that level, I feel. Because, like I said, I've seen the people that are involved, the people that have shared with me. You've done a heck of a job, Paul, putting together the theory of what I feel the history should be about. And I'm only a little part of that. Well, I'll that give you a background in my... Uh... My inspiration was Ed Parker. I mean, I knew of Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris and all these individuals through movies and whatnot, but I knew that if it wasn't for Ed Parker, we would have never seen Bruce Lee or Chuck Norris because they would have never been involved with Mr. Parker's International Karate Championships. I, I got to tell you a really funny story. So let me finish with that real quick so that you can go with it. The point I'm sharing with you is that I walked into Pasadena and that was, I met Mecca. That was for me was my moment of saying, wow, I'm in the right place. And that's how I knew Frank Trejo. He had saw me at a tournament to watch me fight. And because that influenced me to come to see him. And I'll never forget that day when I first met Frank Trejo, it was in uh, a karate tournament produced by Frank Trejo and Dan Ridardi. And it was in 1978. Obviously, I was there. I competed. I lost because it was the first time I had ever fought against a certain type of fighter. And Frank taught me the lesson of the fight in your mind and the fight in the ring. But that same day, I was very lucky and, and honored to meet Ed Parker. He walked into the, into the gym. He looked left. He looked right. Looked at me. Walked right over to me. I'm standing by the judge's table. And I'm looking, saying, uh, there ain't nobody over here but me. He came up, walked right up to me in that long brown jacket, the white salt pepper hair, and said, hi, I'm Ed Parker. What is your name? And I said, I'm Paul Casey. And from then on, I never forgot that. And he said, are you going to compete? And I said, yes. I didn't have the nerve to tell him I had just lost. <laughs> I didn't want to ruin a first impression with the guy, you know, so, hey. But um, that was that. And then I was... Best honor is when I made black and he, he signaled me out that day on March the 21st, 1981. And John Conway was one of the people that I tested with. His dad was there, all that. But the last conversation I had with Ed Parker was in August of 1990. And he said, I, unbeknownst to both of us, he would be passing in several months, December of that year. But he had said to me, he says, Paul, and I always called him Mr. Parker. And he said, come on, it's Ed, it's Ed. And I said, he says, is there anything I can do for you? And I said to him, I said, Mr. Parker, you've done more for me than you'd ever know. And he, he was so 
pleased. He shook my hand. He wished me good luck at the tournament. He asked me to come and eat with him the following week. Sadly, I was in. I went to Japan. I didn't do that. Um, but the point is, is that the uh, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame was premised off of the camaraderie ship and 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 res mutual respect of the community as one, like the internationals. The internationals was like a reunion of greatness coming together, and we respected one another. We competed against one another. We either celebrated or reflected on how it went, but we look forward to the next year, and we always did. And that's what the Hall of Fame stands for. And by the way, there's not there's not just Ed Parker, American Kempo. We have Tracy, Kaji Kempo, Lima Lama, Shaolin, Chuan Fa, um, Hawaiian, uh, BKF. We have numerous fractions of Kempo. You know, the yeah. law of the fist. Is not just relegated to one. My body is my weapon. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, and and so that's where it is. I think Mr. Parker, I think Mr. Parker would be very pleased with how that is, and I'm honored that you would come on onto the show. So, what is the? So let's ask this much, uh, Gary. What is the goal? What's your goals for the for the sports museum now at this point in your life? To honor the history of the icons that established it in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and now the 90s. To remember the, what they came to America and established through their martial arts. So I've taken the, the heroes, the people that have stood out, not the ones that have just been in the magazine or the movies, but the people that worked hard to create dojos all across America. And I found out by working with those icons, they've had students who produce sometimes more than what they've accomplished, say, in the 60s and 70s. So I honor the people that are recommended by those icons, too. That's why you, for instance, if you have somebody that, that you want me to honor, I will, because you're part of the, the Alumni Museum now, and you're part of the history, because, like I said earlier, every time I talk to you, I think about Frank and Bob and... Mr. Parker, I think about those guys. And that's cool because that's what I've done with my event every year, which by the way is May 1st this year in Houston. When these guys come and people maybe not know who they are except through the advertisement, but they see the charisma of a J. Pat Burleson or whoever I put out there, they realize that all the work that I do throughout the year or whatever, that it's worth it to be around the charisma and the R of that person. I really believe that these guys, I'll tell you something that you understand. This year I'm doing a memorial wall of all the people that we've lost and your pictures are on it. So you can write a little note to them. But every year from day one, I've had the karate angels. And this is where I sit up in front and I have, well, to the public, they're empty, but they're like 10 chairs on the right, 10 chairs on the left. And they're people like Howard Jackson, Joe Lewis, Sid Campbell, Mac Mako, you know, all the people who've lost. And they sit up there with me and they help me run my event. They're the Karate Angels. Now, I know that sounds weird, but it's what I've done every year. And people understand because those guys that created the history in America, and I do it through the Sport Karate Museum, is so important because whether they're gone or they're active here now, we have to honor their history, what they did, so the people in the future will know the fundamentals of how it all started. That's the goal, to teach. It's always about being an educator. You know, so, you know, sure. Let me pause right. it right there. Pause it right there and fix your camera, okay? I got a couple more questions before we end. And uh, how do you envision the future of the martial arts in 10, 15, 20 years from now? Well, I believe in the people that are, have learned from those people that led uh, the way in the 60s and 70s. I believe that the black belts of today have true heart or true art, but some of them have, I guess, gone astray because of the internet. But there's a, I believe in, 15, 20 years will be just as strong because I believe that the fundamentals are still here and people are still here 
keeping the martial arts alive. Now, I think point karate will change because, of course, we've almost gotten to the Olympics full time, but, you know, Taekwondo is not karate. And, you know, even though it's introduced this year, you know, Black Belt Magazine allowed me to write articles about it, in my opinion, and I got information from other people, and I still, you know, understand that it won't be accepted yet because, face it, even the WKA or the group that governs it, they're brutal. And the American people, or not American, the world hasn't seen that yet. Now, I do believe that Kata will be out there eventually, will be a full time part of the Olympics because, as you know, Kata is mesmerizing and it will take hold of the world. Now, when they add the musical and all the in, invaded things that we're doing now with creativity. It's going to be entertaining, and I think it'll be part of the Olympics. So that's the future is, is passing on. So people, something like the Olympics or the Pan Am Games will continue on. So it's out to the general public more. Lower your camera, please. I'm sorry. Okay, so you, okay, so the question is then, you believe the future of the martial arts will be promising? Promising, yes, because people are working hard. There's, you know, uh, from say one to hundred, eighty percent of the people they're working hard and they're influenced by real people right now. So, in fifteen, twenty years, I think it will be promising and stronger, and people will will <laughs> carry it on. I mean, think about it. people have known and made a living all these years, but they've made a living for other people. You know, and it's like going to the Super Show Ball in Las Vegas and Mike Dillard's event with Century. You learn so much because there's so many people there that pass on. And that was the idea of Mike in the beginning to put together people. And Las Vegas is such a hub. So Super Show is very powerful. Let's get, I've got one more, two more questions and then uh, we'll wrap it for today. Um, I'll use this one. If you had a chance to spend some quality time again with a few of the men and women that influenced you but no longer here, your first in teacher, say Joe well, Lewis well, or Mr. Boy, Harrison, what would you say to them? Well, I would say I love them, first of all, and I appreciate their time they spent with me and sharing their knowledge and that I, I hope that I could stand up to their image of what they thought of me now uh you know the thing about it is those guys like mako and uncle sid and uncle wally you know they had a lot of people around them god bless them but i know that they looked at me as being a person that represented hawaii and that's been my responsibility for all these years not just the responsibility of sport karate but to represent my state and the art that i brought from hawaii so, yes, sir. Well, thank you, Gary. Professor Gary Lee, amazing sports museum. Uh, you know, you are an amazing kind of guy. Your passion for it is quite evident. I am grateful that you would come on today, share this with it, uh, with uh, our viewers. And specifically, I'm truly humbled by all the, the wonderful comments you said to me. Uh, it, it's, it's, you got, you're, you're making me have to live up to something, <laughs> but, uh, you know, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you know what, Paul, I believe in my heart that Kempo changed America. There's all these styles and all these people have made up their things, but you know, the originality of what Mr. Parker brought to America, I'm so proud to be just a small part of that lineage. You know, Mr. Farr, Jack Farr, and, you know, these people. But you know what? I really believe that that what you're doing is teaching. And again, as I said to you, we're all educators. And as long as we can educate that public out there that don't know about martial arts, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So Thank you, Gary. You know, God bless you. Looking forward to Thanks. talking to you again in the near future. All the best to you, sir. You're Hello, awesome. Uh, my body is my Mahalo. Weapon. Thank you very much, sir. God bless you. You have a good one. Take care.